Okay, so today is the last day in March 2019. Tomorrow is the day where everybody tells lies, isn't it? Is it also in, in your place? I don't know. <laughs> Brenda in Giro, Damiana, what is it called in Italian, in, 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 in English? <laughs> yeah, where we make fun of each other. Anyway, uh, let's start today. We have uh, the idea to go through the orange level of development. And I think as uh, Jeremy came and we others know each other already, we should do a very short check-in where you are, what you do, and uh, what your interest is, main interest, why you are here, and then, then we go into the topic, okay? Who wants to start? Well, I, I'm Ron, and I'm from um, USA, um, New Hampshire, up in the New, New England region, and I'm um, <clears throat> interested in the... Um, development uh, with the integral perspective, uh, both my own holistic uh, development, but also to work in the field I work, which is uh, uh, coaching. I'm Karen and I live in Berkeley, California, ground zero for the mean green meme. But today I'm in Menominee, Wisconsin, uh, for the first day of a three-day meditation conference. I'm meeting my guru and about 250 other people, so I may have to leave early, probably around um, uh, uh, maybe uh, half an hour to 45 minutes early. I apologize. And I'm interested in everything integral. I've been reading Ken Wilber since 1982. I've been meditating for longer than that. My interests are spiritual, um, but also I'm a historian by training. I have a PhD in cultural history, and I'm currently writing a novel set 11,000 years ago, but it's about the major transition we're in now. It's about being in the middle of a catastrophically major transition from one world era to the next major world era. And I hope to launch a blog soon. I'll let all of you know about it when I get there. The, the priestess heroine from my novel, my, my best friend forever from 11,000 years ago in my imagination, she's gonna make snarky comments on current events from her Stone Age point of view. So um, putting it all together, presenting it in a package that makes entertaining reading for a mass public, but the, sub, the, the deep structure is integral. I'm hoping to take integral, integral mainstream, that is my modest goal. <clears throat> Over and out. Hi, Jeremy. I'm Damiano from Italy. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and I've been interested in integral theory for about 10 years now. And I'm just super, I just love these calls and happy to have you on board. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I am Jeremy Johnson. Uh, let's see where to start. Uh, uh, I'm an author. I'm a recent author of Seeing Through the World. Uh, it's a book on Gene Gepser and integral philosophy. I've been very interested in this topic for the past 10 years or so. Um, got my master's in consciousness studies from Goddard College. So I'm very interested in how a lot of these ideas apply to what's going on right now in what Gepser calls cultural phenomenology. So, so what's our experience of being in the world and where are the stressors where are the potentials, right? Um, so I'm very interested in kind of looking at culture with the theory and having that kind of feedback loop between culture and theory. And then of course, the question about this transformation, right? This cultural transformation. So that's sort of a, me in a nutshell. And you are Thanks in in Florida? Oh, or what? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Florida. I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm originally from New York. I'm a, I'm a recent transplant. Um, but yeah, it's right here on the Gulf Coast and it's a pretty cool little city. We got a lot of bookstores. So that's always a good sign. And I'm Natalie, I'm here in Portland, Oregon uh, with Ryan and Tim. Tim's not here today, he's off at an uh, NBC camp this weekend uh, as a cabin counselor. And um, my work is in psychology one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but I've also been very interested in facilitating group processes and conflict transformation um, teaching nonviolent communication and um, ways that we can support uh, the evolution of green into healthier um, integral stages through the intersection of communication and psychology and shadow work. Uh, 
Uh, I'm Paul. I'm in England. Um, I feel a little bit kind of knackered and vegged out today, so I'm sort of sat here thinking, like, what are my integral interests? Um, I think it's part of me. It's like kind of everything and anything. It's kind of what I like about integral. And also, like, um, I just think integral <laughs> has more sense to say at times. Um, I think, I think my interests are probably like therapy, shadow, um, community, and something around. Um, like the subtle body and like science, like making that uh, more solid. Um, yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm Kate. <clears throat> I have, I'm kind of sick, so I'm cough, coughing a lot, so I may not have my thing unmuted very much. Um, I'm. I've been. In, I was. I lived in Boulder for many years and and was involved with integral things back way back when in 1990s or something like that and have been um, using this these these theories and principles in my work I work in prisons and with uh, at-risk marginalized or whatever you want to call it populations underserved populations and so um, just just mostly for me the the practical applications and I like Karen's modest um, aspiration to what was it bring it to, <laughs> to the whole world or something yeah thank you and yeah well, welcome jeremy it's great to have you join us today and i'm um, ryan originally from hawaii now living in portland oregon and um yeah my interest in mostly is just in building community and, and building this integral community and, and just seeing uh, uh both here live in portland and also online um so yeah i'm really happy to uh be in this call today <laughs> Yeah, and I'm Heidi in Italy, but I'm German, and I came across Ken Wilber about 20 plus years ago in, in, in Italy, by the way, in Italian. I read the first book, Snow Boundaries, in Italian. And then, uh, you know, since then I was blown away, and together with Mark, I tried to make the Wisdom Factory, set up the Wisdom Factory to interview and talk with people. It's not really an interview. You you have done it. It's more a conversation. And to help uh, bring <laughs> with your modest aspiration into, into mainstream by, by sort of being able to talk about it or to be in a certain way when we talk about topics which are not integral theory uh, so that people have an, a glimpse, can have a glimpse of what that might be. So that's my idea of what I want to do, what I do. And I have created a sort of this, and I'm happy about that. And hopefully the second um, talk, with, which Ryan has uh, initiated about this debate practice room, uh, will go ahead. Uh, I think, Ryan, you will do another uh, doodle to find out a, a, a better appointment for that. And then I saw Devi arriving. Are you able to show your camera to, to come on? Um, not right now. I, but thank you. I wanted to thank you uh, since you're calling on me for inviting me, uh, yeah. Heidi. I was thrilled to get the invitation and I heard you uh, in one of our breakout rooms in Miles' course, Dharma and the Evolution of Conflict. And I guess we just had a good breakout session. So I'm just uh, delighted that you would invite me. And I was awake here in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Before seven. So I'm here making coffee. Wonderful. We have some of, of the early morning birds here too, no? From... Uh, California and so so you are not alone in making coffee. <laughs> <laughs> have you been can I just ask you and if you don't want to go there it's a little of how long have you been doing these uh hosting these chats? Has it been going on for a while or it's brand new or we did about eight or nine or something or seven or I don't know, two months more or less. <clears throat> about uh, every week, once a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. So when you are ready, show us your face. I know it's beautiful. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, and again, it's off topic, but it's purposeful. <laughs> I've been working on the phone with people for about 12 years. And I actually find that it's more 
effective. And this isn't just me. I've taken a rather large sample sampling of survey. It's anecdotal. It's not scientific. But it, I find again and again, trying it both ways, that it's actually more powerful to go by audio without the screen. Now that's just my experience. And I'm a very visual, unlike a lot of females, I'm very visual. Maybe that's part of it, that I'm so visual that the visual input's distracting. Okay, you know, I, yeah. I like it uh, on, on video because then I then meet the people as I will have occasion to meet one person who I know only by video in, a, right. in, in two days. Then it's always the feeling like we know each other, since, yeah. you know, all the time. By the voice I often had when I met the people, who, that's it. Right. <laughs> oh, him. So. Uh, but I invite people to notice and experiment um, for example, I discovered this through coaching and doing some groups and participating in groups on the phone and then also doing it by, with the video, with the visual. So I just invite people to examine that in their own experience because what, is, what I discovered was happening is actually a transference kind of phenomenon that's happening below the level threshold of consciousness, even in people who are um, more than average aware, even in the turquoise and the, uh, you know, these other above orange, right? We're talking about orange today, above orange or above, maybe not the right word. It, people um, uh, beyond the, um, at the orange being the ceiling of what they're accessing. So take a look and let me, if anybody wants to report back, you know, in a couple of weeks, what that's like for them. You okay. can try to have a blind call once. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did both. I did a long time telephone coaching and then I, I actually prefer very much to see people. So, mm. Okay. The, so far, whoever is ready. I also, Paul, Davy, when you want to show us, your face is it's fine if not you know then in the recording there is this horrible white <laughs> white head in the <laughs> place of <laughs> anyway that's not the problem let's dive into orange what can we bring together about orange uh, your experiences your I, I don't want that we go too much into theory more in practical examples of how it ex is expressed what you found of Good things and not so good things. So, open to you. Oh, it, it's a good focus uh, for me because um, um, the um, orange <clears throat> phase when I was in that exclusively was very intimidating because of the uh, high achievement orientation uh, that the um, perspective um, encourages, which raised havoc with my self-esteem. <laughs> and um, also I in some way never fit it in because I started composing music when I was like six and even writing it down. Um, and so the, the um, it, interior part of me, I was more at home with than the exterior, the exterior. And <clears throat> I see the orange is uh, very, you know, external, you know, like, kind of like, you know, what I achieve is uh, my identity rather than who I am. And <clears throat> when it got into the 60s rebellion, I like that, you know, who I am is being more important, you know, being more highly valued. Um, even though um, today I feel like I've brought forth the, uh, positive sides of um, orange uh, in the sense of achievement and the rationality because there was a time while I was getting in the rebellion that I was just strictly, there was an emotional expression that I didn't have any validity. <laughs> you know, we really kind of like rebelled against the rational and then I saw some of the kind of production of that. So, um, so, so the orange is a very um, 
heavy part of my own journey and uh, evolving and growing. And um, it helped so much to uh, when he discovered um, Wilbur, you know, his theoretical perspectives of there being different stages. Um, I found that so validating because it was kind of like, I wasn't a misfit in the um, orange phase. It was just that I was moving or my, you know, my inner self was moving more for the uh, postmodern and more expressive and, and that. And then during the time I was rebellion against that, I felt, you know, some kind of um, in a negative hostile because it was like anti-capitalist, you know, anti-achiever, anti-rational. I mean, it was just a very negative place. And so when it was, again, the last year, working with uh, Wilbur's work, to be able to um, bring that forth and see the positive and embrace that as part of who I am. Uh, and then it's shifted on how I can relate to people that are very um, strong in identifying themselves of, of what they are rather than who they are and be open-minded to that and see that as a positive, even though for my own self, I, I treasure a lot about who, who, who one is and, and, um, and my, my creativeness and my, uh, uh, spiritual um, stages that I'm working with and evolving and, 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 and but to integrate the two uh, I, I I find it very liberating so um, I'm really happy to be here today to hear, hear you all and uh, to share this stage oh one of the things that comes to mind when I think of orange is the, the different ways that we can interact with some of the subconscious material and the shadow. It's one of the, the, the things that I work with in Integral is that shadow. And um, at orange, I find that um, it's more of a sense of suppression where we're recognizing that there's something that's part of ourselves, part of our lives that we don't want to be there. And so it's suppressed. And um, I feel like depression comes online as a psychosomatic experience uh, more than in other stages uh, because we're recognizing there's, there's that conscious element that's being suppressed. So depression happens as a way to numb ourselves and pretend like it's not there. And um, One of the solutions is a sense of purpose that we get from some of the earlier stages of uh, red that power and the community in blue and there's you know that um, common quote a man without a purpose is like a ship without a rudder and that that sense of purpose is the significant part of orange um, giving us a, a direction in the, the craziness of the sea of life and in first year we're still really trying to make meaning of life humans are meaning making machines especially at orange and I feel like at later stages, second tier, we start to um, value making meaning out of life a little bit less and are a little bit more comfortable with our rudder being shorter and using different ways of navigating the sea. Um, but at Orange, we really need to have a rudder. That's, that's pretty much what it's all about. What direction are you going? How are you going to get out of where you've been stuck? and find some very, very new horizon, some very new sense of purpose that's outside of the familial or familiar ways of, of living. Thanks. I've got to jump in here. I apologize. I just got this, the 10 minute signal from my ride to my meeting. So I've got to cut out. I would just like to quickly propose after we've gone up all these levels and done the quadrants, maybe we can tackle shadow and projection. And with that, I bid you all a very fond farewell. I will listen to this later with eager interest. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bye, Karen. <laughs> Take care, Karen. Happy meditating. Yeah, I find that interesting what you say about the achievement and purpose, because um, there are so many courses uh, offered now, find your purpose and uh, develop your potential and so, and I thought that was sort of green, but the underlying um, effort is, is orange. I think, you know, maybe the content uh, then is green or maybe the, the strategies or the exercises, but, but the underlying um, 
impulse is orange to get the most out of you, uh, out out of yourself. I, if I can, I think to me this is very interesting. It was something that I was thinking about like ten minutes ago, uh, and I love uh, your quote about the idea of a, of a shorter rudder. And I think that in a sense, one could describe the shift from blue to orange as the emancipation from a a set of norms of duties that are not necessarily rational. They're completely just based on repetition. So there's this emancipation and the form of, of rationality, but it's still a collective rationality. It's something that is that we inherit a lot from others. And in a sense, I think that that shift also that you're describing, Heidi, this sense of needing a purpose, which I think is anyway a necessary bridge to get uh, to the second tier, is the emancipation from collective rationality and the identification of your own rationality. And once you find that, the, the rather, in a sense, I think gets shorter, because if you do it with presence and meaning, there is also less attachment to that uh, intuition that comes. So to me, these are sort of the, the, different, the differentiation between um, blue, conventional, uh, traditional rationality, orange collective actual rationality and then you have a sort of intuitive integrated rationality that that goes beyond this is my personal sense of the evolutionary unfolding of these different stages um i was gonna say for me like when i think of orange and purpose i think of like the objective world like if there's one thing orange does it like really gets shit done like kind of um science you have like industry just kind of explodes um i think there's like a there's like a massive emphasis on on the objective world um which i i really like as a contrast to green i remember reading um watching these these shark den things where people were pitching ideas for businesses and stuff and there was such a like rigorous um kind of grilling somebody to make sure they knew what they were actually talking about um and like I don't know, almost at times I kind of get this thing like results almost justify the means. Like your your feelings at times um, don't really matter. Like it can kind of be, um, it can kind of be like a little bit brutal in some ways, but in some ways that's kind of like quite nice to, to integrate. I could pop in there too <clears throat> with what you were saying, Paul. Um, from my own background with studying uh, Gepser's approach to integral philosophy is very similar insight into, um, he doesn't have stages per se, but the mental structure of consciousness is very similar to uh, Wilbur and Beck's orange stage in that um, it's very individualist oriented, but it is also very directive. Now, like the, the, meat, the word itself, and Heidi and I were talking about this yesterday, the word itself, mental, means wrath if you trace the etymology and the roots back menace means wrath directed will and anger um so if you think about all of the kind of the early gods right the the um the gods that had some kind of commandment or law or edict um the kind of consciousness that was coming online with a sort of the early or well, middle city states and like Greece and the kind of male patriarchs and the kings and the emperors and the warfare, all those things have this directedness. There's a directedness now. There's, a, there's a, um, an individual who's standing in three-dimensional measurable space who's going forth either on the battlefield or on a quest to sort of conquer the myths and conquer the dragons and conquer whatever. Um, and they have this process. So there's a directionality that emerges in this. And you can see this with, with the mental or with orange. There's a kind of, you know, what is your directionality in, in, in this kind of capitalist culture? It's sort of to accumulate wealth, to self-actualize, to individuate, to transcend, to kind of move forward with yourself. So this forward directedness, right, that sort of separates you from the sort of mythical clan and enclosure, for me anyways, is, is, is exactly what the mental is all about. And this is its power, is that differentiation. This is kind of, what do I want, right? Um, like you have like Odysseus say like, am Odysseus, right? He's, but he doesn't say I am Odysseus in the old language. So we have this like slight shifting now into this I-ness as opposed to this collectivity, which, you know, pre-literate societies very much held. And then the book only reinforced that, you know, scribal culture and then print culture 
um, and the novel as an art form very individuating. Um, and then I think a little bit, just, just a comment from what Natalie was saying earlier too, which is really interesting uh, observation, this idea that in orange, depression and, and the psyche in, in some kind of way as a shadow starts to show up. Like the mental is really good at sort of cutting off from the meaningful participation in these archetypes and gods and this kind of open exchange between them. We, we're kind of, we've woken up from that, right? So it's sort of distant from us. Yet we know we're kind of missing it. So it's always kind of haunting the mental. It's always kind of there in the background. James Hillman talks about that too, like how um, the unconscious used to be diffused around that it was the world. But in the mental and in orange, it all of meaning gets sucked up into the subject. And then the world becomes this neutral, three-dimensional, measurable space, objective space. But meaning gets sucked out of it and it has to go in here. And so pathos and the gods and the archetypes all start to kind of play up in the human psyche and hence psychology emerges. So just noticing some interesting connections we're all, we're all mentioning here, but just my two cents. Thank you. I also wanted to connect what Natalie said, because um, I think in blue, there is a sort of a acceptance of where you are. And in orange, you finally figure out when you don't succeed, then it's your fault. Before it could be the fault of somebody else or from the community or it was just, you know, uh, accepted. But now it's your fault. And now you can go into depression because you are not good enough. You know? And all these things appear. And yeah, this is a, definitely a big shadow side of, of Orange, which leaves people out and disempowered because they are not as good as the 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 first elite let's say you know and also this uh this tendency to compare oneself not to who you were yesterday but who the others are now you know and so you have always the possibility or to uh, to feel um, inferior in some way or to pretend to be somebody else and and try to make it by you know put everything into to be uh, on the first in the first row so yeah quite a competitive and depressing <laughs> state at the same time stage not state yeah just going back to what you were saying jeremy that was really interesting have you read the book called passion of the western mind by richard harness oh yeah 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 That's that I, I love part. that intellectual outline of intellectual history and and you know i'm a big fan of intellectual history and it makes me think about how I don't know if Tarnas puts this explicitly or this is just something I garnered from his reading and, and from reading other similar books, but to me, the, the history of evolution of consciousness, like you can look at it one way, is a process of withdrawing the mind from the world into the subject, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of like very, kind of like a Hillman-esque, Jungian kind of a way of looking at things too, and how all of these things that were once projected out into the world. Like if you look at like ancient Greek philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, those guys, they, they was very much based on this idea of like substance, like substance and predicate, as Aristotle called it. Plato taught, you know, had Plato's theory of forms. And then later on, all the Enlightenment philosophers like Hume and Locke and Immanuel Kant, they were like, these things are not actually in the, th you know, in the world. These things are, you know, like Kant's a priori categories of intuition. These are, these are in the mind that are projected onto the world. Mm -hmm. So the human mind kind of takes center stage. And in some ways, that's kind of what leads to like the alienation, you know, like the alienation yep. and the anomie and all of that alienation from everything else. And then green is like trying to trying to reconnect that. But that, that's that's one of the things I, I really appreciate about Orange, but also that drives me crazy about Orange is that is this constant like division, like division of labor, right, for economic efficiency and increased specialization. And like that's when the big three were separated in Orange, right? I mean, you had you had the good, the true and the beautiful cons, you know, three critiques and and that was all cleanly separated and, and also culturally uh, in society, right? There was the separation of the economic, cultural, and political spheres, um, like fr the, from the French Revolution and everything. But I think what, like yesterday, I was at the dentist for two and a half hours having absolutely brutal operation on my um, root canal. And I'm very grateful for the, for the technology because if it weren't for that, I would be dead because I had an infection literally going into my brain from my root canal. But one of the things that, to me about orange, that's certainly a limitation that I think needs to be healed definitely at teal and turquoise is that not only is there kind of a disconnect between 
like the mind and the body or like, you know, holistic medicine, which is very prominent in green, is that orange even disconnects different systems within upper right quadrant, right? Like a lot of, a lot of doctors do not understand how one body system interacts with another body system. So it's like, if something's wrong with my teeth and I have a lot of dental problems, people are always blaming me that I don't floss. I've been flossing every day for 10 years, right? I, I don't like take care of my teeth, but I have other problems with like my digestion and, and with my pH that causes teeth erosion, but the dentists don't understand that. So they just think that it's all because I don't take care of my teeth. And so even just reintegrating, uh, you know, it like upper right or lower right quadrant systems within themselves, I think is a huge thing that needs to be done. Mm. Um, but, but uh, I, I am still grateful though, because if we're in for orange, I would be dead with a tooth infection. So, so I'm, I'm very grateful at the same time. Yeah. I like what you were saying too about, um, First of all, it's a great book and it's a great companion to Everpresent Origin because Tarnas and Gepser basically have the same thesis about sort of the history of consciousness and how it's evolved and how we've kind of narrowed down and kind of brought the psyche into the self and to the subject, these sort of individual monad, right? But um, yeah, I, I was just going to say, you know, that the, the great thing about the mental uh, it's it's its strength and it's its weakness. And Heidi and I were talking about this in, in our conversation yesterday too. It's this capacity of the mental um, to enact ratio, which is making the cut. And some of the early forms of philosophy as a kind of an oral practice, a kind of embodied non like preliterate practice. You know, the Socratic method. Um, they called it diuresis, which is to to cut apart, to dissect. So there's this cutting that the mental is able to really do. The, the previous structure, um, the, the magical and the mythical, they're very intertwined, it's very embodied. It's all about acoustic and hearing. And acoustics and hearing is a very kind of a holistic sensorium experience. So you, you bring a lot of different dimensions into, into that practice, into being a philosopher, but having to engage in like an, a dialectical debate, right? Being embodied. but with writing that sort of splits it apart, like the alphabet in Greece splits apart language. It turns it into, into these little segments. So the mental has always been really good at the cutting part. The, the, even the, the, the three, uh, what do you call it? The big three that um, Kant talks about and Wilbur talks about. The three is interesting. And it, to me, this always is like a great way to orient ourselves and what exactly is the mental and how much we are still in terms of even if you see it as a stage or a structure, it's so predominant in our culture, the mental still, because of what we're talking about right now, segmentation, um, doctors not being able to talk to each other, et cetera. But it's that pyramidic style of thinking of kind of like being in a spatial three-dimensional plane and looking at the event horizon and having that kind of the eye and then the event horizon forms a triangle. All of the early Renaissance artists were drawing this triangle. So the three always shows up like going way, way, way back to the big three, going back to the Renaissance and, and the actual like um, treatises on drawing perspective and Leonardo and Di Pittura, um, and all of these kind of manifestos about perspective. And then of course the thinking style itself is this pyramidal cut. It makes the cut, it cuts the mythic membrane. Um, so as mental beings, you know, I think we're dealing with a crisis right now and how do we reconnect? How do we actually develop the capacity to connect with each other and link back without losing the strengths of the mental. And I think this is sort of the, the challenge that we're dealing with today in, in culture is this, you know, there's all of these different identities erupting and um, all these different movements. So there's this kind of new freedom, but it's still kind of segmenting things, but it's trying to connect things. You see, we're kind of right in this middle space, trying to birth this sort of new big picture orientation without losing the discursiveness of, of, modernity. Um, so anyway. Beautifully explicated, Jeremy. And I want to appreciate, Heidi, what you started out the invitation with here, which was um, what in your own experience is orange about versus, or maybe not versus, in addition to understanding the integral theory and the stages. So I just want to share that as someone who's trained in the clinical sciences and medicine, um, by which I 
means scientific biomedicine and as a clinician, not a bench scientist. And that's definitely not the only thing I do. In fact, I've kind of, as I've gone access these stages, was morally obligated at some point to leave behind, um, well, to transcend and include the rational and the hyper-rational and the analytical and the mental. But that that is no longer the center of gravity. I access it as a resource and it cert forms a certain foundation personally as well as like in some kind of professional domain, you know, working and serving other people. What was, what's interesting for me to ponder is, and I hadn't thought about this before, is that when I first met with the integral, um, I forget if we call it Wilbur II or whatever, because it was a long time ago. Um, it was in the mid 90s. I think it was 95 or 97. And I had read Spectrum of Consciousness and the previous Wilbur works like, um, you know, transpersonal stuff. When I read A Brief History of Everything, and I don't think the colors and the graves uh, work is in there. The spiral dynamics is in there, but the quadrants, I was like ecstatic that someone had described with such precision um, my experience of multi, of stepping into multi perspectives. But I have to reflect back that at that, the time that I accessed that, and then a short while later, um, Ken and um, I forget the guy's name from down in da he was in Dallas, Texas, um, who brought forth all the graves work. Don Beck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a few seminars with Don, and I was living in Houston at the time, so he was around there a lot. And I realized that I was already solidly in green and actually in the process of rejecting the limitations of the green, the kind of boomeritis and, um, you know, all of the <laughs> problems of the mean green. So I was in this, I won't call it schizophrenic, but day to day I was practicing medicine and the biomedicine in the mainstream in a very kind of multidisciplinary way, like brain and neurology and psychiatry mm -hmm. and oncology and geriatrics and in the trenches and also practicing dharma for many years and then working with all of this integral work and and uh beginning really well into transcending um the green in terms of my access not my center of gravity so um, I could obviously ramble on about this for a long time, but I wanted to share that I discovered through listening to your conversations that when I came into the integral work, um, low 20, more than 20 years ago now, that I, um, that that's where I was at. And so Orange, while I appreciate what's being described of what it is, and I definitely couldn't be where I'm at or experience where I'm at or access other levels um, without the orange, I feel um, its limitations like a really tight shoe or tight pair of jeans whilst appreciating the rational, it tends to go hyper-rational if people haven't accessed the other levels. And I think the one personal, really experiential um, moving beyond orange and green for me came when I was being coached. And I had actually the privilege of being trained in coaching by Thomas Leonard. Who's, who's really, he's dead now, but he's 
trained Werner Earhart and he started Coach University and is really responsible for the whole coaching kind of thing moving into the mainstream, largely one of the figures. So what I discovered, which it was also reinforced as a yogi and as an athlete, a competitive athlete way back when, was that insight does not come through theory or this mentating or intellectualizing or not to be pejorative at all. I love it too. Can you tell? But um, that insight, real insight comes through experience. In other words, you get some coaching, you, your mental faculty doesn't want to believe it. It's because it's not referential learning. When you put it through your meat grinder and compare it to everything else you know, the coaching might not make sense. But if you have the relationship and the context with the coach or the space of the coaching to just implement it, do what they say, give it a try, especially if it's not like life-threatening or jumping off a cliff, and the re real insight comes through the embodied experience of applying, whether it's coaching or theory, of really applying it. And when I got that experientially, it really, it not only rocked my world, but it really blew the lid off whatever orange and even green that I was leaning on. So I'll stop there, but um, it's, a, it's kind of, I appreciate what everybody shared a lot, but it's kind of a different take, I think, on, um, it's not philosophizing. It's like really embodying and applying. And that's where we come to Kate. She is applying into God. Into <laughs> Would you like to? I, can, I, can, I keep coughing. I really can't talk, but I, I, I yeah, I, I'll just say I love philosophy. <laughs> I love what you guys had to say. I think that's where the um, being in the the uh, spiritual stages, um, you know, states uh, is what to me uh, separate the insight. <clears throat> which is kind of a, what I call it, kind of like a mental gymnastic uh, maneuver in my head of insight versus awakening. And um, the awakening is a whole different experiencing of grasping a shift in what I'm also experiencing mentally. And um, that uh, incorporating the two together rather than being silo, your meditation on one side, psychological development over here, the putting them together um, has been a real um, transcendental, trans, you know, a, a really amazing type of uh, uh, experience and how I see life and perceive it. And I'm working with clients now with moving towards the awakening process. And <clears throat> consequently, there seems to be a much more transformative shift they're finding with their lives. And um, um, and I, I think this integrating approach, and I think that's the same thing with the culture, you know, the the, uh, the rational, the uh, um, uh, orange did a tremendous job of fragmenting the whole Western culture uh, on the downside of that. Um, but it did pull it out of, of course, the uh, religious mythology and, and the cruelty that that brought. And so I, honor those factors but what i'm seeing today i really think moving forward and moving towards more an integrated type being and community and global um world community um maybe if anything save the species itself from its uh, um ultimate destruction that i see as one one outcome we may be headed towards and um so um, I, um, 
the achievement, the rational, the um, containing one's emotions, like that's somewhere where the, the um, um, orange brought the downside of red okay. into containment and getting a handle on, and that that's one of the gifts of the rationality, uh, the ability to step back away from, like say, conflict and look at it from a third perspective, uh, just like a scientist, you know, investigating something, you know, those, those kind of mental shifts that the orange uh, brought forth or we evolved towards, um, I think is a great gift. But I think also the fourth, sh the fourth um, person to be able to um, come from a witnessing place, um, a more transcendent, transcendent place and seeing a larger whole of how we are, in, how we interrelate, um, how much we are fragmented that contributes to a lot of the violence and to the uh, disconnect and all that. Um, I find that um, it's sort of like um, one of the expression is the cut, the cuts, uh, the Cartesian, uh, you know, perception. Really, was the way we, the West had its own way of, of beheading uh, humanity. You know what I mean? And um, and I think that to reintegrate our total being, you know, the, the embodiment of our physicality, the uh, reclaiming uh, the uh, heart felt brain part of us and the um, the uh, three brains, you know, and and just we you know recapturing uh, so much that was the price we paid for the enlightenment, you know, for the industrial achievement capability. To me, it was it's too high a price that um, to to we we um, uh, gain the earlier stages, uh, both culturally and um, personally. Uh, and, and move that all towards a more integrated whole, like you say, second tier. Um, I, th I think it's, I, I just find it one of the most exciting parts I've, 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 I've felt in my own life. And to share that with other people and see their excitement, you know, and to share with you guys, um, I think I think it, 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 that transcending the orange and bringing forth uh, what it, the gift that it was, I think it, it's a good move. I'm hearing from the last few shares that we want to get out of orange, but we first wanted to, to talk about it and see what it is and not immediately go out of it. So uh, I, I was thinking while you were talking, what is the religion of orange? Because there is definitely a religion. No? So uh, let's, let's go back to orange no? and, and explore that a little bit more before we step out of it. <laughs> yeah, that's um do you, want to, do you want to go, Jeremy? No, go ahead, Paul. Um, I was just thinking when you talked about the the religion, like I think that's one of my biggest beefs with um, with Orange. Like I was thinking of like Richard Dawkins and sort of like atheism. There's something about the hyper rational world of Orange that just like makes me feel like so disconnected to my heart. Like it's kind of it's awesome when you're going off and you're doing stuff and there's mass industry and there's business and there's all this like outer activity. But when there's kind of like um, there's something about like the world kind of like lacking inherent meaning or something like this. Um, and, like I, if I think of Dawkins, like, cause people were talking about this kind of triangular slicing of like separation and all this kind of stuff. Like one of Dawkins theories is kind of this selfish gene, which is kind of, um, almost makes nature sound like mechanical. Like it's just like down to its most reductionistic. It's just these genes and they're kind of like, um, just battling for supremacy and there's a kind of elegance to that theory like if you if you just take it um on its own merit this this interesting but like if you think about it like metaphysically or philosophically or kind of spiritually like what that might mean for the world um personally i kind of find i just i just feel like just dead like um th th there's just kind of the world is just this like ro kind of robotic newtonian sort of clockwork machine um but like i don't know almost like in the uh, i think to me dawkins is a good example because it's kind of like the ass end of orange like in the early days that was kind of incredible like there's part of me like um being english it makes me quite <laughs> proud because like as the the brits we kind of like completely kicked ass when it came to orange um somehow our tiny little island like managed to dominate the entire world so like 
having all this explosion of technology, but like in the later stages, it just feels like, um, I don't know, like the death of meaning or something. Mm. Mm. Uh, Paul, let me, let me jump on what you're saying because um, I kind of wanted to talk about something similar with Orange. I love the concept of Orange spirituality. It's such an interesting topic because um, again, you know, okay, so the way I've kind of traced it and the way like folks like Gebser have traced it and maybe Hillman, maybe like Patrick Harper, they've written about how like, you know, we went from spirits, plural, you know, having multiple spirits and multiple souls and being in a kind of a collective ecology of souls and spirits to having one spirit, right? So just like the collectivity moved into the ego, now all of a sudden we have one spirit, one transcendental spirit, which is a God, right? A monotheist, just as we get the ego. And then from this one spirit, we get this sort of abstract principle, this sort of transcendent principle, which is kind of moving out of the sublimity, the kind of deific sublimity of the logos is kind of moving into now these kind of abstract Western philosophical principles that sort of take the place of God. Um, and then there's negation. So I move from spirits to spirit to negation of spirit, because once you lose that kind of numinosity in the kind of early mental, the early orange that had, you know, like a lot of these Renaissance thinkers and scientists and empiricists, they were all like, a lot of them were, were not, they were materialist in, in the sense that we would understand, but then they weren't because they had this kind of, um, oh gosh, what, what were they called? Deists, right? So this kind of transcendent principle that they thought like they were understanding the knowledge and the language of God by understanding how the, the universe physically worked, right? These abstract principles were a way to kind of commune with God. So they had this kind of, Richard Tarnas talks about this, this kind of cosmic inflation, this kind of anthropos principle or like the human being and in particular man can abstract and by abstracting know the thoughts of God, know the thoughts of creation. So there was a sublime transcendental inflation in the early mental, um, but we lost that. But we still had the inflation and we still had the abstraction. And without that, yeah, we lose the sense of the spiritual and then it's just matter. It's just the kind of the principles of matter, right? Like actually one of the books that I really like, it's from uh, it's Tarnas as well called Cosmos and Psyche. Um, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but he has this like quote from Kepler where he's writing in his diary, basically that he's like found this divine secret. He's figuring out like geometry and, and, and gravity and, and these principles. And he's, he has this kind of like, you know, this like, yeah, I dare frankly to confess that I have stolen the golden vessels of the Egyptians to build a tabernacle for my God far from the bounds of Egypt. If you pardon me, I will rejoice. If you reproach me, I shall endure. If the, the die is cast and I am writing the book to be either read now or by posterity, it matters not. It can wait a century for a reader as God himself has waited 6,000 years for a witness. So again, th th this is a scientist who's come across these discoveries. So to me, like this is the sort of, this is the orange spirituality at, as its heart. You know, like we talk about healthy forms of a stage or a structure. Maybe this is a healthier form, right? Where it's kind of more connected to that spiritual principle that it was inspired by at any rate, you know? But at the end of the mental, at the end of orange, of course, we get the sort of narrowing down, you know, that the ratio that's made the cut has finally sort of cut itself off from its own inspiration. Um, and, and then you get that kind of narrow materialism. What, what did you call it? The, like the, the ass end of the, of the mental of, ra of the orange, Paul? I, I love the way yeah. you put it. It made me laugh out loud. <laughs> so anyway. That sounds like a cool, cool band name, Ass End of the Orange or something like that. <laughs> Ass End Orange. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I find what you're saying, Jeremy, is super interesting, but, but it, it raises a key question. I think that part of the assumption, at least in the language that we use, is that that was an early orange. But the case is probably just that there are different kinds of orange depending on the um, availability that they have to states of consciousness. And, you know, if Copernicus, who seemed to be like a pretty rational guy, could have his own spirituality, it probably shows that th 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 that process of alienation could be avoided altogether. Mm -hmm. and, and so 
I think that one of the, probably we have a bias, a historical bias in just associating orange to a godless state or a spiritless state and so on and so forth. Well, that is just one of the things that happened in Western society, which is, has been specifically great at that. If we look at all the ancient civilizations, they had great mathematic, mathematicians, they great doctors, great scientists in a sense. So I think that the question of what is the religion of orange highly depends on how much they can access these, these states. And, and in the end, I mean, if you take modern physics, it is a form of mysticism. They're just, they're just basically saying like, instead of using all the four quadrants and all the cool tools that we have to discover spirit, that's just one and make ourselves really unhappy until with the, the least efficient tool, we get to the same answer. But the lack of that is that in using that highly inefficient tool to get to spirit, because it, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to just sit and meditate for three years looking at a dot on the wall. But then the result of that is that there will be no doubt at that point. Whatever knowledge comes from rationality, you can't really argue with. And I think that the reason why Advaita Vedanta is becoming so prevalent is because it's rational. It's a kind of non-dual spirituality that kind of sets the logic of his own demise into nothingness. And so the, the question of religiosity at Orange highly depends on what religiosity you have available in the first place. Mm -hmm. I really like that. I also wanted to go, I don't know if you have... Uh, uh, read uh, the Sci Science Delusion by Rupert Sheldrake, where he makes the case that um, science has become like a, a dogmatic religion. Mm -hmm. So uh, th that's very, very, very interesting. So yeah. science has become itself the religion, you know, has substituted uh, God. <laughs> what is it about science in, we're talking about Western countries, Western contextualized mental and orange. Um, what is it about our particular trajectory through this awakening of consciousness that orange has become similar to the way blue was or similar to the way the mythic was at the end of the medieval period where it was feeling very constricting and it was ossifying. Is this something that happens to all of the structures or is this something that we can avoid somehow as we're, we're just saying it? There are, there are earlier examples of healthy orange that had different relationships to spirit because they had access to states, they had openness to these different states. So I guess I'm just wondering why in the West has orange become so narrow and rigidified? Um, in Gebser's theory, of course, it's that all of the structures kind of go through almost like a life cycle. They kind of reach a point of immoderation. Um, but I just want to kind of open that question up. Like, what is it about us that's made us so cut off, you know? Yes, perfect, perfect. Okay. So at every level, right, it's the failure, the dysfunction of that level that actually spurs catapults, usually. Usually it's a crisis. It's not a personal one, a collective one. That catapults you, lands you gives you access to even the possibility or a little glimpse of the next, you know, of what's available up ahead or in the next developmental band. And the question I was thinking of earlier and listening to you, Jeremy, was, and again, I'm speaking out of my experience, not theory, is, uh, the differentiate, what is the function? Like operationally, like every day in your life as well as your intellectual life or philosophical life, but what is the operational function of differentiating? Like splitting everything up into black and white or, you know, polar extremes or even shades of gray. And what I discovered uh, directly in um, experientially in the in some very radical direct embodied non dual practices not Advaita Vedanta because they don't have that right the Tibetans and some of the other uh, non dual paths of practice 
do have ways of doing this. Um, the function, I'm going to actually answer my own question, and you may find something different, or it may continue to be a big question mark. But the function of differentiating this, this almost hyper-rational kind of splitting and, and differentiating and diuresis uh, you pointed to, diet means to cut across. The function of it is to dissolve the differentiation. It to actually, it actually, it's not actually a function to dissolve it purposefully. What actually happens when you step into the successive levels, the view from there dissolves the split, the polar opposite, and the differentiation. You're kind of stepping from a world of via negativa and via positiva and the dualistic worldview, and you're literally experientially stepping into the view of accessing a larger whole wherein the differentiation doesn't quite disappear. You can still access it, right, at the rational RNG uh, uh, embraced level of orange not the fine and that that's not your highest but that it actually tends to dissolve and disappear like first there is a mountain then there is no mountain then there is you know the old donovan song and i and uh, uh there we could do the um other versions of that the world me the world me and the world i am the world so you know, that's what I wanted to share experientially is that this orange is very, and I don't mean this isn't a, a sexist comment about maleness. It's an archetypal comment. It's very hyper rational. It's very um, mechanistic, reductionistic, hyper masculine. <clears throat> and it's really testosterone poisoning at its extreme until we can access transcend and include the successive levels. The function I found of this differentiating mentation is that it can give us access to dissolving this um, very, very hyper-rational differentiation and splitting. Mm. I'm having an image of... Um blue and orange and green come into mind where some of the, um, say that we have three different religions and we can list them out in a very rational way of there's step one of each of the religions and step two. And um, rather than them being religions that are at war with each other and the rational stage, we can start to see that they all have a step one in common and what's in that step one is similar and so on for the other steps. And uh, that that sort of breaking down and making things so linear allows us to later on see the common threads between um, the different segregations that we had before and, and how valuable that is with orange. And so there's an example of the breaking down being for our, a later stage of uniting. So these are making me think, and I'm by no means very familiar with the biological sciences, but it's still making me think of just the principles in nature where speciation occurs and there's differentiation that's always happening. There's new morphologies emerging and different organisms that create and relate back to each other. And this seems to be a simultaneous process of differentiation and then interconnection, right? There's always some kind of symbiotic cooperative element to it. It's not just competitive as, as we've been learning over the past 50 years or so about um, uh, cooperation's function in evolution is very important, perhaps even more important than the whole narrative of opposition and survival of the fittest. Um, so I don't know, I just kind of want to throw that in there too, that, that as, as, um, as we were just mentioning, uh, and as you were saying, Debbie, the, there's something interesting about 
ratio and cutting and, and differentiation? What's the point of it? What's the function of it? As you're asking that question, I was suddenly thought of, well, think of speciation. Think of the emergence of a new organism and how it embeds itself in this environment, in an ecosystem, in a sort of dynamic system. So it, it, it's, it is that kind of dissolution in that sense. It's a sort of creating something, standing it apart, and then relating it back to the whole and participating in it. For human beings, I mean, this is sort of more of a mimetic thing where, where our life worlds are differentiating and our selfhood as a kind of a subjectivity in, in, in the mental and in the orange is this kind of standing apart from the world, creating this now differentiated individual who's able to be self-conscious and reflect on, on, on themselves and have, it, have a, a capacity to not simply just kind of get drowned in the collectivity and to stand apart from it. But then how does that individual reconnect to the whole? And I think this is sort of a similar principle that we see in life everywhere at every level of life is how do we work back into the ecosystem? Um, for us, it's really difficult because we're not just kind of instinctually adapting again. Like we're not just sort of doing that. We have to be, we have to find a way to consciously bring bring our self-consciousness back into the whole. And that seems like a very difficult task and kind of an intensification of evolution's challenge, right? Which is we're self-conscious beings. We feel a sense of self-separation. That's not going to go away. Um, so now we have to somehow internalize the way it, that dissolution, that connectivity, that wholeness in a very self-conscious way rather than a kind of like a latent or implicit way that the rest of life gets to do. Um, so it's tricky. It's tricky. It happens very organically. And what is required, that's what we see in nature, right? It just, the inclusion into the whole ecosystem, the whole collective, the whole tribe, the whole species, it happens very organically. So we see that in the natural world. We see that from, you know, molecule bacteria all the way up, all the way down. And for us as humans, um, I mean, we're not just, even though most of us here on this call are probably like brains connected to elementary canals, as Ken once called it. I thought that was a great ectomorphic uh, um, description. If we pay attention to our bodies and the earth and the archetypal feminine, uh, I'm not saying on. I'm not saying get rid of the mind and the rational. Just check it with your shoes at the door. Drop <laughs> into your body. Train in the body. Somatic psychology. Somatic awareness. Real meditation, not head meditation, the way it's mostly taught, the way it's mostly gotten translated. Mindfulness. It's not mindfulness, it's bodyfulness, it's lifefulness. It's like get down into your pelvis and your groin and your legs and the earth. And when you do that kind of practice, which are widely available, you want some names? You want me to coach you? You know, you want some bigger names that are more expensive or less accessible? Just give me a call. You know, once we do that and we just start listening, right? No, not coming just with any uh, conclusions beforehand. Just drop into it and start listening to the body. Find, find the place of essentialness, like from the rational or psychological side, what might be called the ego. but I, again, I don't mean it in a pejorative. Find the, pl the place of non-existence, it's sometimes called in these practices, in the body. Find that core, that essence, and also that capacity to be with the uncomfortable emotions and just dialoguing, just dialoguing with them, becoming familiar with them like a muscle, just training in being uncomfortable as the body and the sensory life is experiencing it. And as soon as one begins to do this kind of practice without any expectation or any goal, and then you gradually, you know, you start integrated it into your everyday life. You're, you do the snacks first, the small experiences before you go to the banquet of uh, 
like a big lawsuit or a divorce or something, right? <laughs> Just when you're feeling uncomfortable with a friend or a relative or a coworker in the office or whatever, and you can just actually be present with it and notice what's going on in your body, then we begin to get access. And once we get access to that, there's no going back right? It's, it will begin to integrate with all of that orange, green, whatever. So that's very exciting place of development and practice. It seems to me that in orange, we don't have a body. We have only <laughs> a mind. <so. laughs> if we have a body, we have cells and molecules and yeah, we yeah. have description. I mean, in, in your awareness. I would like to, I would like to a little bit disagree just just for the sake of conversation. The fact that I do not so many of the things Debbie you mentioned are, are obviously absolutely true. They are in a sense what I was referencing before as a faster, more efficient way to get knowledge. Uh, it's it's easier to find out the truth about the universe by doing Zen meditation than by trying to resolve the fundamental theory of physics ultimately you may get to the same conclusion and i think that one of the things that we need is that if we want to communicate to people at orange so many of the things you mentioned they need to be explained with the language of orange if you're able to prove to a highly scientific person the physiological uh, emotional neurological effects of grounding they will follow it and i think that often the the prejudice against orange is based on the idea that they're just mean and materialistic. No, their burden of proof for making decision is just a lot higher. They just don't do things because people tell them they do them because they absolutely rationally make sense. And I think that if we're able to bring these two things together, it's a lot easier to get a lot more people on, on these kind of paths because if you are highly rational, this, the thing that is going to make you do the step to some embodied meditation thing, it's just that you suffer enough and you're willing right. to do something weird. Right? Exactly. Like, just you like, have to suffer enough. But the thing is you're that... You're willing to go beyond the hyper-rational. No, but yeah, but my, my point is that if you suffer enough, you're going to go beyond it. But if you don't suffer enough, those paths need to be made available to you in a way that, makes, that they make so much sense within the language of rationality that you can naturally pursue them without the discomfort of having to do a step that rationally makes no sense. So to me, this so is just that... that we can honor the green in trying to translate all these things that we know to make sense and to be true to spirituality in a language that could reduce the discomfort of people who need to understand exactly what they're doing. And that I think that there is a huge value in that because any times we made decision in history not understanding what we we're doing, we did a lot of damage. So that, that's my take on how to re-embody, reintegrate and give value to Orange and communicate to Orange. It's destined to be reductionistic. It's like trying to fit a, uh, the sky into a shoebox, a size five into a size, or a size eight into a size five. It's like, Telling the child what chocolate tastes like by giving them a book about chocolate instead of putting the candy in their mouth. Can I interfere a little bit because there is Paul who wanted to, to talk for a long time and hadn't had a chance. And I would like to interrupt your diet a little bit. <laughs> um, I was actually thinking, oh, there's a bunch of stuff. I really like Jeremy and Damiano's thing a while ago because I could feel my spirit connecting with orange like actually orange isn't just really like mechanistic and there's a sort of um there, there is like if i think of like something like the golden ratio or i think of like pythagoras there is this kind of like connecting with the mind that seems really spiritual and there's another part that i think that's sort of connected with the sort of damiano and devi kind of talking and i i spoke to this a little bit with ryan but it seems like at every stage there's a potential for pathology a lot of that seems to be the degree with which it backlashes against its prior stage. So like a lot of my beefs with orange are when it's totally like rapidly against blue. So spirituality is like really getting like chopped out in any kind of um, sense of like connection. Like Debbie, when you were talking about having all this like um, distinction and chopping up things that's then 
brought into like a, a sense of oneness. That's what I was kind of hearing. There's, a, there's this incredible uh, beauty to that. Um, and I also had a bit, I suppose, a bit of pushback because this relates to, I think, sometimes the idea that it's suffering that pulls one stage into, the, into another. Like, I think some of that is true. But um, I think there are plenty of times where there's too much suffering. I mean, if you look at Orange and like the world wars and all this kind of stuff. So I think on the one hand, like Orange uh, is destined to be hyper-rational, but I also think the other side of the coin is Orange is destined to be green. Ooh, that's a good insight there. Um, yeah, I just, I have to go in a, in a two or three minutes, but I just wanted to um, uh, feed back into those comments and a lot of what's been said here. Um, you know, I wanted to introduce another philosophical concept uh, of ascesis. Um, there's been some interesting work from CIS recently uh, by Adam Robert, who has a journal about this. Um, but it's basically this idea from Pierre Hadot, philosopher, that really one of the good ways, as uh, Damiano was saying, to, to connect, and this isn't exactly like, okay, here's the science of embodied cognition and why you should be more embodied, but it's still kind of getting to that tracing that intimacy that orange used to have with blue or mental used to have with the mythical um, in that it sees intellectual endeavors, abstracting endeavors as a form of aerobics and mental exercise. And it connects it very integrally and intimately to exercise so that if you are a philosopher, you should be doing some kind of physical activity to enhance your capacity to think. You should be doing physical, contemplative, and aesthetic practices that push you, not only on the cushion, but perhaps some form of physical exercise that pushes you, that enables your cognition to um, move to another level as a kind of aesthetic, monastic approach should be. You know, Those settings are environments that are meant to optimize your capacity to stretch yourself, either your attention, your contemplative work, and your body and all those things kind of synergize together. And I, I like Adam Robert and what he's doing because he's bringing this up that philosophy should be seen as this embodied activity. Um, I think it was Thomas Hobbes who, who quipped back to Descartes, you know, his famous cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. But it was Hobbes who said, well, what, why can't we simply say I walk about therefore I am? But this idea of walking and thinking and being in the body all of these are really good connections and they're really good ways, I think, to kind of reach the mental where it's at, is to kind of go, no, this is a, this is a form of ascesis, of a form of contemplative stretching and work that you have to do. And there's a reason why in Athens, you know, um, the philosophers would walk around in the same room that some of the, uh, the you know, the, in the academy where people were doing aerobics and exercises and combat training. You know, there's this connection in the body with all of these things. And what I said earlier about menace and wrath, uh, the mental and a sort of mythical precursor days as it was just coming online, all of those things were connected. A sense of directedness in space, a, a being who's an individual who stands apart in space and is moving about, um, and this sort of el elation of spiritual freedom in that physical capacity to stand apart and to move in space and to move towards an object, either in opposition or for acquisition or as a dyad or as a triad. These are all activities. The mental is active not passive. You know, what we're saying before, Debbie was saying, it's, it's, it's that um, the masculine principle in terms of the archetype. So you can kind of synergize all of these sort of embodied ways of thinking and being or thinking and doing, right? Um, and then, of course, the balancing act between all of that is, is the, con the contemplative presencing that we're talking about. So that's the being aspect that kind of comes in here that helps us not get stuck in, in a moderation in thinking. So I just kind of want to, I just wanted to kind of comment on what everybody's sort of bringing in here and, and very much enjoying it. And thank you, Paul, for bringing that up too. Peripatesis. Peripatesis, right? Peripatesis. Yeah. Peripatetic, usually mm -hmm. it comes through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jeremy, since you, since you said you have to leave soon, what you said was kind of a perfect segue into my idea of the integral debate. Uh, dojo and you know, ascesis and aestheticism and training and that kind of thing. I, I really resonate with all of that. And um, I love what you said there. And I don't know if we want to talk about that now since you have to go or, or just include you in the email. Did you see the email that Jeremy about the integral debate idea? I don't think I was in that email. I, I just okay. started to get the invites for this. So um, gotcha. if you want to forward okay. that to me, I'm going to leave my email in the chat. 
Sure. Yeah. Great. Run out. Okay. So yeah, I don't have to talk about that now, Heidi, but I just want to mention that. Um, we've been talking about the role of suffering in supporting evolution through stages. And when I uh, think back to some of the people in my life who have moved from orange into green, it's usually been because of curiosity and a sense of curiosity reaching its limit and having nothing left to be curious about because the mystery has been dissected so much and uh, uh, resting into the liminal space when insight arises in that liminal space and curiosity is what's pushed um, evolution to, to further stages. And so I feel like the importance of an interval dojo, um, some of these um, arenas in which we can support that curiosity in a healthy way can, can support that evolution along the conveyor belt and um, also just really value uh, the importance of liminal space and um, settling there in the health of all of the stages, um, especially, especially orange. Yeah, thank you. We have five minutes, so we can do a little bit of a check out. My check out would be, um, I, I just realized now that we are today talking about orange and quite in an orange way. <laughs> uh, for orange is, is hyper orange. I mean, it's the first time I've ever come here, but I got to tell you, and I love orange. <laughs> I love orange. I love orange. I ate there for a long time and only there for so long. But who shows up for orange is people that are at the center of, that their center of gravity or where they mostly live is orange. Isn't that interesting? And I think we do really need orange, especially when we go ahead. Green without orange, uh, I mean, like I think, uh, Ronald, it was you saying that uh, you, when you came into green, tried to avoid thinking and avoid the rationality. I did the same stuff, you know, I did stupid things and I, I have sort of a, an angel uh, who has protected me from the worst. So that is a misunderstanding of, you know, of, of how uh, development works. But I didn't know Ken Wilber yet, you know, so. <laughs> Maybe I have, would have done it a little bit different. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was nice again, but that is my check out. You, you go ahead. But I think my check out would be, um, it, you, it's, pull, it's pull, pulled a lot together for me, and so I'm still kind of going to spin mentally and all that. But the thing that struck me was um, how much I need to evolve more and, and how to dialogue with people that are still all very dedicated in, uh, in staying with Orange and um, how, how to make a better connection with them. Uh, I think that awakened me today that I'm not too good at that yet, <laughs> but thank you. Not suggesting that anybody should check their brain at the door or their mind at the door, their rationality or their orange at the door. But the capacity to recognize it as such, know its limitations, hold it loosely and hold it in abeyance while you drop into the body and the experience and the earth and the surround, right? And then, you know, you can always uh, drop back into orange, even hyper orange or hyper rationality and uh, re-examine re the whole thing from that view. Hmm. So that would be a description actually of some of my practice as it evolved organically, as well as you know what I consciously do. Check all the thinking, rationalizing, drop into experiential, and then I can always put it through my meat grinder when I put my shoes back on. It'll be there. It'll be there on the shelf. Yeah, similarly, how much the um, body itself and our, our internal physical navigation can give a sense of direction in um, higher stages, higher 
um, states and so on, um, rather than, than our mental direction of intention. Something that's really standing out to me about this conversation. Um, but also as well, I've been uh, working on my giant whiteboard here in my bedroom and um, trying to um, understand how to incorporate integral into some of the conflict transformation um, programs that I might be uh, putting on sometime in the future. and. Mm -hmm the the value of uh, orange and differentiation and um the value of how orange can select certain parts of uh communal values of blue um is standing out as like a step for that conflict transformation of community values and giving us a sense of direction um that we can later knit back together Thanks. Um, I think for me, the most valuable bit was just like uniting spirituality with orange. Just felt like that's clicked something in me and I'm going to kind of enjoy going off and thinking about it. Um, like the kind of profundity of science or like how some sciences were kind of, I don't know if Einstein was green or orange, but he always seemed like a bit of a kind of mystic to me. Um, and also I think one of the things I have to think about with integral is like there's kind of a battle between um, or, or at least at least where I I'm look on the forums and stuff between science and spirituality. Um, I was actually reading a Frank Visser article before I came on it because I thought oh, it would be interesting. And it was part of me that was just like um, really disappointed, I suppose, because the article just didn't seem that that great. Um, and it was kind of bouncing between these two extremes. And I was just thinking about like how uh, amazing integral science could be. Like if there are people out there that are doing it with their um theories then I, I think I'd be like devouring that if I knew about it. On this point there is this really interesting guy called Wolfram. He's a mathematician. There is an amazing video on YouTube that I'll, that I'll share soon and he's talking about the idea of a new kind of science. Of a science that with it basically a single concept can computationally automatically produce the vast complexity that arises in sciences. And Ultimately, that's what integral theory implicitly posits, that there's got to be one rule, one thing that mm. does not explain your formlessness. That's the only thing you can't really talk about. But everything else and everything that is right before it can be beautifully explained. And uh, so I, I think I'll, I will link that in the video. It's, it's fantastic. And I think that the more we're able to make all this stuff that we do make sense for people, it does not mean, to, to get to your comment, Debbie, it does not mean that explaining the physiology of embodied and meditation, people will get the experience of it. That, that's not going to, you know, reading an, a paper on it is not going to make them enlightened, but it's going to sediment the trust that allows them to commit time to it. And I think we, we need to honor that Otherwise, many people will still feel alienated by being told you should do that because orange developed in, in uh, alienation of blue, which is just rules <laughs> that I should just take because someone tells me. And I think that uh, if we want to get orange on board, that's not going to cut it, essentially. There is a way. And obviously, they are the first ones to understand that knowledge and, and experience or that should be the thing to be explained that knowledge experience are still two different things but they kind of build a shared ladder it's a beautiful explanation thank you when one can access embodied non-dual state it's a universal computational device it's the one rule to which you point Okay, before, it's not a rule, but before it's a practice. Okay, before Ryan, you can check out last. I would like to ask everybody, also Jeremy, uh, I will write him a mail, to or send me the the information of the books, the names, the authors, or when we go to the, I will post it again on Damiano's platform. Where, nothing really has happened yet, so it doesn't seem that you are very much uh, going there but that uh, you either send it to me or post it there when I have posted the video there. 
um, the authors, so many books were named, you know, and I, I can't remember them because most of them I don't know. So it would be nice that we have a collection of, uh, of um, resources uh, together with the video. Okay, and now over to you, Ryan. Yeah, well, thank you, um, everyone. This has been another uh, really interesting discussion. And, um, and it's just so funny how synchronistically it really s springboards nicely into my idea of the integral uh, debate, uh, I don't know, league or whatever. And for me, one of the things about Orange that I do like in terms of the science and biology and stuff and, and the debate, too, it really comes out of Orange rationality is, is this idea of, like, self-correcting or, like, self-improvement or, like, okay, I was wrong about that. I got the new facts that were better. So I update my system and, you know, science is constantly updating. And I, and I feel like introducing that explicitly with this, with this debate uh, thing, I think would be, would be really interesting. And I guess my question for, for people is, you know, Heidi had suggested the idea, you know, certain format of it being like um, having a moderator and having like a one-on-one -on -one and having people uh, like join. And I'm, I'm just curious for like, so for myself, I have a lot of experience in debate and studied it extensively. I have no problem. I'll debate anyone on anything, anywhere, any position, but I want to make sure other people really feel comfortable and really feel like it's a space where they can feel safe and free to explore their perspective and that kind of thing too. So I'm just curious what format would people, and you can email, you know, share the email too, but like, um, yeah, Damian, you want to? I would just like, uh, first of all, I'm Italian, so we're great at debate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I would love it. I, my personal invitation is we don't need to make it too kind, friendly and safe. If we feel comfortable with, I'd be happy to have a bit of a lively confrontation, especially if you can have also a dojo. I think an mm -hmm. integral physical dojo would be nice. <laughs> but I, I am personally super into it. I loved the topic of free will that had come Great. up. I, I just right. saw that in two minutes, we were already all riled up to yeah. like discuss it. So oh, yeah. I can't wait to have some brutal discussions. Great. So let's schedule the first one. Damiano versus Paulo next Friday. Next Friday. Friday. What a crappy day. Friday. Oh, Friday. man. That was the day that worked well for everyone else. I, oh, well. I, well, I'll skip the first one. I, I just can't on Friday. I'm, I'm going to be out. So as soon as we get the first um, meeting scheduled, you know, and another one, Heidi, I thought we could do Jordan Peterson as integral. That would be another really fun one. Yep. Um, if you're just interested. That first. Just that. Oh. Um, yeah. And then I'll just post it on the forum and invite anyone else who wants to observe and comment after. Mm -hmm. I would uh, suggest avoiding a format that polarizes. It's not this versus that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if you can somehow, not that triangulation is any fun, that can be pretty combative, worse actually, because it can get gridlocked uh, very nicely, log jammed. Somehow, if you can come up with a format, or maybe you have some experience as a debater, that's not two or three, it's not limited to two or three, but it actually has somehow functionally or operationally process wise the opportunity to expand beyond two or three i'd be interested to hear you know what comes up for you around that you mean two or three people davy no i don't mean individual people i mean the way any academic uh, debates are structured because all that's pretty much coming from blue orange level mm -hmm. is polarity and polar opposites this versus that two positions and i'm just introducing right and that's that's exactly when you get to triangulation you know psychologically what triangulation is it really log jams tends to log jam the whole thing it doesn't go toward mediation usually it log jams so what process could you come up with that wouldn't either polarize or triangulate that would that would actually create a, a dialogue or expansion right I and i'm posing it as a question i have no clue i have no clue we will see what ryan is coming up with as he said he has experience and so we will we'll, after the first one we will see how 
how it went. And maybe we can then see from our perspective if we find the structure or whatever we want to say about it and, and, and see how it worked. <laughs> So just really quickly, I know, Paul, I know you want to say something, but just really quickly, Davey, the, the entire purpose of this is to showcase to the world what an integral or teal debate looks like. So it's not what you were describing. And mm -hmm. for me, one of the things I would really like to emphasize is we need to culturally make it a virtue that you change your mind. That, oh my God, that's a great point. I never took that into consideration. You know what? I'm going to really go home and chew on that and, and integrate that into my perspective. We need to, we need to valorize that and to get away from this, you know, our current political situation. That's where I would start. I want to hear everyone else's uh, input. You know, we can discuss it over email and that kind of thing. But Paul, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, I appreciate Debbie's point. I was actually thinking of, and Heidi, I don't know if you're on this call, but I was on one with um, Diane Hamilton. And she was talking about um, conflict and holding, she sort of like um, ran people through this experience of like oneness, um, and then tune us as a kind of like fair response and it being uncomfortable and then finally like it being kind of a, an attraction and excitement and um, I kind of I don't know I really got an experiential thing with that that I imagine like um, I think the whole like two opposites that are just butting heads I mean I think that is a fair there is merit to that I mean that's kind of red in some ways but um, I don't know if you're you're describing this but what I was imagining was like it being integral, it needs to be like more inclusive. Like if it's the Venn diagram, both circles should be getting bigger. They should be including more. It should be like uh, two parties kind of battling out, but also kind of becoming sponges for each other. Something, um, I don't know if I can, I mean, I'd kind of enjoy riffing with Ryan, but I, I don't know if I have a, a sort of uh, a mental way of putting that, but I feel like that basic experience is quite a good premise for it. At least like, some of what it should include. I'm really looking forward on the demonstration. Friday, what time? You are muted, Ryan. It said on the doodle poll that. Um, okay, good. Uh, yeah, it was, but uh, but there is a the time change, so I'll just release another one called Integral Crossfire Doodle, and and we'll see uh, who can. Who can make that? But Damiano, I mean, if you can, make, I mean, that was the one that you were excited about the free will. So I don't know if Friday works for you, but if you fill out the poll, we'll we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. I got the link to the doodle thing, but if you could give a couple sentence explanation of now, I'm kind of connecting to what that was. But when I got it and looked at it and all the times, I didn't understand what it was. Yeah, and you do a new new one, uh, no, Ryan. Uh, you can throw away that one, Davy. You will get a new one. Okay. And it's trying to find times when people will get together and do integral debates. Is that what it is? Yeah. What yeah, I understand. Okay. Yeah, it's Damiano and Paul, and Ryan is doing the moderator, and we can watch. No. Oh. I just got to say it's not, it's kind of not like I've been. It's funny that I've been thrown into like I don't mind to be the same oh. time as. Me. <laughs> I think that's sort of like penciled in. That is only an exercise. It doesn't have to be publicized and everything, you know? So don't worry. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, Paul, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll debrief about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will now stop the recording, okay? <laughs>